To listen to American Scandal one week early and ad-free, join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. It's January 14th, 2013, in a hotel room in Austin, Texas, and Lance Armstrong braces himself for what could be the biggest moment of his entire life. Armstrong is 41 years old and the most famous cyclist in the world. He's overcome every obstacle he's ever faced, grueling races, cutthroat competition, even cancer. As Armstrong nervously looks around the hotel room, he reminds himself that no obstacle can take him down. He's a winner, not a loser. And today is a good day. It's the day that he finally turns everything around. All around Armstrong is activity. A television crew is fiddling with multicolored cables, plugging them into a boxy monitor. In the corner of the room, a TV producer is speaking quietly with Armstrong's lawyers. The lawyers then turn away from the producer and walk toward Armstrong. The two men are middle-aged, and they're both wearing charcoal suits, red ties, and expressions of deep concern. The lawyers tell Armstrong that it's time for the interview, but they remind him it is not too late to back out. He doesn't have to do this. Armstrong shakes his head and reminds the lawyers that this is his chance to get the public back on his side. He can't turn back now. The lawyers try one last time to convince Armstrong to skip the interview, but Armstrong refuses, and a moment later, he calls out to a young production assistant and says he'd like to be taken to the interview suite. He's ready to get started. Armstrong walks down a hallway and steps into a hotel suite. As he enters, he spots the production crew who are handling cameras and lighting equipment. And then he spots the famous interviewer. She's wearing a light blue dress and has a calm, almost regal expression. Armstrong knows he has to gain her trust, so he flashes his most charming smile. Well, hello, Oprah. Oprah Winfrey, the television star, walks over and extends her hand. Hello, Lance. Ready for today? I guess as ready as I'll ever be. Wonderful. Well, have a seat. I'll be over in just a minute. Armstrong sits in front of a pair of large cameras. A sound man approaches and clips a microphone on Armstrong's shirt. Soon, Winfrey returns and takes her seat. All right, Lance, any questions before we get started? <laughs> well, I thought the questions were your department. Winfrey nods, but doesn't crack a smile. Well, you know, Oprah, I was thinking, uh, I know we talked about this interview being gloves off, no holds barred, but what if we just ease into things? You know, describe my journey, how I never really knew my dad, how I beat cancer, became an activist and a philanthropist. We could just tell the whole story before we can get into the, uh, the lies. Yeah. Listen, Lance, I give you my word. I'll be fair today. But we had an agreement. You deceived the public, and now you're here to come clean. That's how we're going to start things off. Is that okay with you? Because if not, we don't have to do this. Armstrong feels his heart beating faster. In the past, he might have argued in a situation like this, maybe threatened to walk out. But he's no longer the golden boy of cycling, and he knows that if he's going to save his career, he has to play by the rules. <sighs> yeah, of course. All right, Oprah, whatever you say. Well, good. Okay. All right, everyone. Let's get rolling. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Yes or no, in all seven of your Tour de France victories, did you ever take banned substances or blood dope? Yes. In your opinion, was it humanly possible to win the Tour de France without doping? Seven times in a row. Not in my opinion. There's so much more that Armstrong wants to say. He wants to tell the TV audience that most people would have done the same thing in his situation. He didn't feel like he had a choice. Not with the cards he was dealt, not with cancer, not with having to compete in the corrupt world of professional cycling. No, it was never possible to win the Tour de France seven times without breaking the rules. But Armstrong also knows that his enemies and critics will never understand his choices, the sacrifices, the risks you need to take if you want to be a legend. Still, Armstrong has to try to explain himself. He has to get his critics to understand his story, because it's his final shot at redemption and his final chance to save himself. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body, season three, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. <laughs> In America, we celebrate the winners. We offer glory to the top of the top, whether they're politicians or CEOs or Hollywood actors. Many of these celebrities achieve their success by working hard and playing by the rules. These kind of stories are especially satisfying when the winner starts as an underdog and overcomes seemingly insurmountable obstacles. And the rise of Lance Armstrong was that kind of story. It captivated the world in the late 90s. Armstrong had become a legendary cyclist, winning race after race, and he did so even after surviving cancer. Armstrong offered a story of perseverance and hard work, and he became internationally famous. He met with world leaders, he dated celebrities, and for a time, his foundation sold yellow Live Strong bracelets that became as iconic as the man himself. But then it all came crashing down. 
In this four-part series, we'll trace the rise and fall of Lance Armstrong, a legend of cycling, a master manipulator, a cheater, and a former American icon. It's a story not just about a driven athlete, but about the pressures to win, no matter the cost. This is episode one, The Boy from North Texas. It's the summer of 1977. Today, the sun shines on a dirt track in Plano, Texas, glinting off a row of shiny BMX bicycles. Lance Armstrong glances left and right, wiping a bead of sweat from his forehead. It's a scorching hot day, and Armstrong is lined up along a row of other bike riders. Like Armstrong, they're all young kids, and they're all waiting for the bike race to start. Lance smiles and grips the handlebars. His mom bought him this bike, and racing sounded like it would be fun. This is the first time he's raced in a league, and while Lance knows he's not the best rider, he hopes that if he pedals fast enough, he could maybe win. Lance looks off to the side and spots his stepdad, Terry Armstrong. He's a big, muscled man with dark, slick back hair, but he's standing far away from the other dads, who smile and cheer for their kids. Lance knows his real dad left him a long time ago. Terry is the only father Lance has ever had. He's tough, and he can be mean. He often threatens to send Lance to military school. And when he's in the mood to punish, Terry grabs a wooden paddle. The welts can last for days. So today, Lance can only hope that he'll do well enough in the race. He doesn't want to get another paddling when he gets home. The whistle blows, and Lance starts pedaling as hard as he can. He feels the wind in his hair as he zooms past a couple kids. He feels free, like he's flying. Lance then leans into a turn as he swerves past a hay bale. For a moment, he slows down to catch his balance. But then he realizes that he's fallen behind. He starts pedaling furiously. The wind and dust sting his face, but he knows he can't slow down. And when he reaches the next curve, he tries to take it without breaking. That's when Lance realizes he has made a mistake. His back wheel skids, and suddenly time seems to slow down. His bike starts to tip over, and Lance Armstrong comes crashing to the ground with a hard thud. He lies still, breathing heavily. He's covered in dirt and humiliation. All around him, he hears the sounds of bike chains ratcheting and wheels churning dust. Lance shuts his eyes. He was the first boy to fall, and everyone was watching. Now he can feel his cheeks burning and the tears coming on. He knows he has to stop them. Crying is just going to make all this worse. But he can't stop. And Lance begins to sob. Right then, he hears the sound of footsteps approaching. He sees his stepdad, Terry, jogging toward him. Terry looks furious. And the second he arrives, he tells Lance that he's pathetic. He tells Lance to get up and says, in this world, you're either a winner or a loser. And winners don't cry. Sitting there in the dirt, Lance feels an anger creeping up behind his tears. He hates Terry for making him feel so bad. He wishes he could punch him. Lance realizes he can't do that. No, the only thing Lance can do is shut Terry up, and the best way to do that is to get back on his bike and race. So Lance wipes away his tears and hops back on his bike. As he rides around the track, Lance knows he can't win. It's too late for that. But he can win the next one, and the one after that. And suddenly, everything seems so simple. If Lance just races and wins, then his problem will go away. Terry will never make him feel weak again. Nine years later, Lance Armstrong walks through an industrial park on the outskirts of Plano, Texas. He's pushing his bike with his right hand, and for a moment he stops and gazes out at the sun, setting in a North Texas sky. Armstrong is only 14, but already he feels like he owns this town. He's one of the fastest swimmers, one of the fastest runners, and he has the trophies to prove it. He's also a serious cyclist. That's why he competes in youth triathlons, and more often than not, he wins. Tonight, as he walks through the industrial park, Armstrong mentally prepares for yet another event. The competition is called a criterium race, and in just a few minutes, he will step on his bike and ride laps around a closed track. He'll face off against some of the best riders in the area. Armstrong continues pushing his bike forward, and soon he approaches the outdoor track. He spots the other riders. They look bigger and older. They could be the toughest competition Armstrong has ever faced. But no matter how good they are, Armstrong is determined to win. A minute later, he walks to the starting line. That's when he sees a man approaching. His name is Jim Hoyt, and with his doughy face and thinning hair, he looks and talks like a friendly teacher. But Hoyt is much more than that. He owns a local bike shop that sponsors Armstrong. Every month, he pays Armstrong a stipend of $400. He's also acted as a mentor and taught Armstrong how to race like a pro. So when Hoyt talks, Armstrong listens. And right now, as the two stand near the starting line, Hoyt reminds Armstrong about an uncomfortable fact. Armstrong isn't supposed to be in this race. This is his first time at the Criterium. Normally, first-time riders aren't allowed to race with experts. But Hoyt wanted Armstrong to get experience with serious competition, so he didn't tell anyone that this was Armstrong's first race. Armstrong nods and says he hasn't forgotten. But Hoyt shoots Armstrong a serious look and says he has to make a promise. Even if he's in the lead, he cannot win the race. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of hot water. Armstrong can't help but give off a look of tired disappointment. But then he nods and says he promises he won't win the race. Hoyt pats him on the shoulder and tells Armstrong good luck and have fun out there. Armstrong then hops on his bike and heads to the starting position. As Armstrong sits on his shiny black bike and waits for the race to begin, time slows down. He's concentrating on the race, but distracted by the agreement he's just made. He's unhappy to lose a race on purpose, but he cares about Jim Hoyt. The man is his mentor and benefactor, so he'll keep his promise. He'll lose on purpose. Suddenly, the race begins, and Armstrong takes off. All at once, he's stunned. He's not even trying, and he's already sailing into first place. Armstrong glances back, astonished. He can't believe these guys are considered experts. 
Armstrong continues to burn past his opponents as he races under the bright floodlights. And then as he enters his final lap, Armstrong spots Hoyt in the crowd. The man's mouth is hanging open. He looks both impressed and anxious. It's then that Armstrong remembers his promise. He's not supposed to win. But as Armstrong glides across the track, he feels torn. He doesn't want to get Hoyt in trouble. He should probably just fall back into second place. But as Armstrong approaches the finish line, something just won't let him slow down. He suddenly pictures his stepfather, Terry. He can imagine Terry laughing at him for being too soft, for losing the race. That's all it takes to push Armstrong over the edge. He leans forward, and he pedals faster, until his body feels like it's going to snap. Armstrong crosses the finish line in first place, and sees the look of horror in Hoyt's eyes. Armstrong knows he just betrayed a friend. But at this moment, friendship is far less important than something else. Winning. No matter what, Armstrong intends to remain a winner. Three years later, a man takes off his white cowboy hat and looks around a crowded barbecue joint in Austin, Texas. He cracks a big smile and digs into a plate of brisket. From a distance, Eddie Boy Savage might look like a rancher from the South, but he's far from it. He's a Polish immigrant and a living legend in the world of professional cycling. Five years ago, he led the U.S. team to win four Olympic gold medals. Now he's known as America's greatest cycling coach and a renowned developer of young talent. That's why he's sitting at this restaurant today, eating brisket with a teenage boy. He got word that there was an incredible young cyclist in Texas, and he wanted to see him in action. Sitting across from Boris Savage, the boy doesn't look like a future legend. He's just 17 years old, with a thick mop of brown hair and blue eyes. But after watching Lance Armstrong compete in a race, Boris Savage was utterly convinced he had to recruit Armstrong. He could be the future of cycling, and Boris Savage wants to help him get there. But first, he has to get Armstrong to join the team. Borisevich sits down his fork and looks across the table at Armstrong and Armstrong's mother, Linda. Well, Lance, Linda, I know what you're thinking. What does this guy want? Why are we spending our time with some old man? That about right? Linda Armstrong sits down her glass. Eddie, we know what you want. We want to make Lance pro, and then make a lot of money off of him. Well, sounds like we can skip the pleasantries then. We'll talk about money in a second, but yeah, you're exactly right. I do want to train him, because Lance, you have what it takes. I saw you ride. I can see your potential. Lance shrugs and looks off in the distance. I'm not even sure I want to focus on cycling. I'm good at triathlons. I might just keep doing that. Lance, you are good at triathlons, no question. But listen, I led a team to the Olympics. We won gold. Now, you may be good at running and swimming, but in cycling, you could be one of a kind. Boris Savage sees a flicker in Armstrong's eyes. He knows this approach is working, so he presses ahead. Listen, Lance, 12 years ago, I met a teenager like you. Still had baby fat in his cheeks, but he was a good racer, and I trained him. Six years later, he became the first American to win the Tour de France. You know who that was? Greg Lamont. You trained Lamont, huh? I did. And I see the same potential in you. It's cool. Seen him on TV a couple of times. Bet I could be him. Or Savage can't help but grin. <laughs> confidence! Oh, this boy has confidence. All right. So then let's talk about the other thing. The money. I make a lot of money in triathlons. What about cycling? Well, if you make it to the top, you could earn a million dollars a year. Millions more in endorsements. Millions. All right. Well, before I say yes, one more thing. Why you? Why should I train with you? Lance. Very few people know what to do with a talent like yours. In the wrong hands, you'll languish. But with the right training, you'll be one of the greatest cyclists who ever lived. Train with me, and I'll help you reach your potential. That's what I care about. I have the record to prove it, too. But in the end, it's up to you. You can settle for second place, or you can choose to be a winner. Lance pauses, and Boris Savage can tell the boy is sizing him up. It really is unusual, a teenager with this much brashness and confidence. But then Lance wipes his mouth with a napkin and nods. All right, Eddie, I'm in. Let's train. Boris Savage leans back with a feeling of immense accomplishment. He's sure this was a big moment in the history of cycling. But Boris Savage can't deny the red flags he's also now witnessed. The kid's talent may be remarkable, but he's clearly too cocky for his own good. Boris Savage will have to keep an eye on that. Because while arrogance can sometimes push an athlete to victory, if it's left unchecked, that arrogance can destroy an athlete, as well as everyone and everything around him. It's July 11th, 1993, and Lance Armstrong is racing his bike down a concrete roadway outside Verdun, France. He's surrounded by lush, green countryside, but Armstrong barely registers any of it. He can only feel his ragged breath, his aching legs, and the hum of bike wheels spinning on the ground. Armstrong dips his head and grimaces. He's bone-tired, because right now he's eight days into his first Tour de France. It's one of the most famous cycling races in the world, and for good reason. The Tour includes 21 days of racing and covers more than 2,000 miles. It's beyond grueling, and even though Armstrong is in his early 20s, he feels like his body is about to collapse. But he knows he can't let up. Not now. Not after four years of brutal training with Eddie Boris Savage. Not after finally making it to the Tour de France. So Armstrong shifts gears and continues pedaling as the burning in his legs grows unbearable. He looks up from the road and sees that he's at the back of a line of cyclists. It's an unfamiliar feeling. Somehow he just can't seem to get ahead. He keeps pushing and pushing harder. But now it fully hits him. 
He's not in North Texas anymore, and these cyclists are no amateurs. Armstrong can't believe just how tough the competition really is. In the last few years, he's won several titles. He's emerged as a great cyclist, even if he and his coach have constantly butted heads. Eddie Borisavich reminds Armstrong repeatedly to race like he's part of a team, to put his teammates' needs above his own desire for glory. And Armstrong disagrees with his coach. He believes he's too good to try to focus on anyone else but himself. But the Tour de France is shaking his confidence. Now, as he continues up a hill, Armstrong dips his shoulders and leans into a turn. And that's when he hears the sound of approaching bikes. He looks over and sees a group of five riders passing him at the same time. He's shocked. He knows he's better than these guys, but he's getting left behind. And that's what does it. Armstrong decides he has to keep up. He can't fall behind any further. He can't have the whole world see he's a loser. So he digs deep into his soul and pedals even harder than he thought possible. Armstrong catches up to the other five riders. And to his surprise, the group begins cutting through the crowd and emerging into the lead. Twenty minutes later, Armstrong spots the red rooftops of Verdun, a small city in northeast France. They're almost at the finish line, and somehow he's now approaching the front of the pack. Armstrong knows that if he can just pass the leaders, he can do what seemed impossible this morning. He could win a stage of the Tour de France. So Armstrong pushes himself harder than he has ever done in his life. Sweat pours down his face. His body feels like it's on fire. Soon, he's in the final stretch and notices the spectators cheering him on from both sides of the road. Only three riders are ahead of him. Armstrong rides faster and harder until his vision begins to narrow. A moment later, he passes two more riders. He's now in second place. Armstrong sees the finish line. It's only about 800 feet away, but the rider ahead of him is pedaling at top speed. There's no way Armstrong can catch him. But then, a miracle. The rider loses control of his steering for a split second. That opens up a narrow gap between the man and the roadside barrier. Armstrong sees this chance and sprints into the gap. He's going about 35 miles an hour, just inches away from the barrier. He isn't wearing a helmet, and for a moment, he thinks he's going to die. But Armstrong deftly swerves and looks up. He's only feet away from the finish line, and there's no one ahead of him. When he realizes what's about to happen, he throws up both his arms and shrieks in triumph as he crosses the finish line, and the crowd roars. Armstrong climbs off his bike, and the crowd rushes toward him. He's completely, utterly exhausted. Still, as the cameras flash and the fans surround him, the gravity of the moment hits him. He is the youngest American to win a stage of the Tour de France ever. For Armstrong, this is a moment to remember. He's never felt so sure of himself, so at ease. Yet just as quickly, Armstrong is stung by another truth. He used up all of his energy. He's physically wasted, and he won't be able to replicate this kind of performance tomorrow. There's no chance he can win the whole Tour de France. For Armstrong, this is unbearable. Somehow, he has to figure out a way to get better, to beat back his rivals consistently, and not just win one stage of the Tour de France, but eventually rise as the champion. About two years later, Lance Armstrong sits alone at the front of his team bus. It's passing along the coast in northwest Italy, where bright blue waves crash against the shore. Armstrong should be enjoying the ride, but he can't today, not after yet another humiliating loss. Armstrong came to Italy to compete in a grueling race alongside his teammates on Team Motorola. He thought they stood a decent chance, but his team got crushed by the competition and Armstrong himself finished in 73rd place. Armstrong can't help but feel consumed with bitterness and rage. He's been training relentlessly, preparing for another Tour de France, and yet he doesn't feel any closer to winning the Tour than he was in 1993, when he first competed. But what really makes Armstrong furious is that the races aren't fair. There's something going on in the world of cycling, something that no one wants to talk about. But Armstrong is done with the silence. It's time to have a talk with his teammates, even if they don't want to hear it. Armstrong suddenly bangs his fist on the bus window and stares at his teammates who are laughing and cracking jokes. You guys laughing? Even though we lost? Do you think it's funny that we just publicly embarrassed ourselves? One of his teammates shoots Armstrong a regretful look. Sorry, Lance, we're just trying to cheer ourselves up. Cheer yourselves up? Look, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of this. I'm sick of losing. We can't keep letting it happen. No one likes to lose. We're training hard. We'll find a way. I don't want to hear it. We didn't lose because we didn't train hard enough. We lost because we're too scared to do what everyone else is doing. You know it. George Hincabby, a black-haired 22-year-old, speaks up. Lance, what are you talking about? Too scared to do what? You know exactly what I'm talking about. We need to get stronger. I'm not talking about hitting the gym. <sighs> You're talking about EPO. Lance, it's illegal. Armstrong nods. Erythropoietin, or EPO, is a hormone that supercharges red blood cells. It offers a dramatic increase in physical endurance, and it's banned in cycling. George, I know EPO is illegal. Guess what? I don't care. Well, I do, Lance. I don't want to cheat. Cheating. Let me tell you about cheating. Do doping isn't cheating if everyone is doing it. And everyone is doing it. I still don't want to. Well, I guess you need to get accustomed to losing, George, because everyone who beat us yesterday, everyone, they're using EPO. And if we want to stay competitive, then we've got to take it too. Lance, I don't agree with you. And I don't care if you agree with me. I'm the leader of this team, and I'm going to start taking it. Now, you don't have to take it, but if you don't, you're going to find another team. And Cappy looks down for a moment. And then he looks Armstrong in the eyes and nods. <sighs> fine, Lance, fine. All right, that's good. I've been able to talk some sense into you. What about the rest of you? The teammates look nervous, but one by one, each of them nods yes. Armstrong crosses his arms and stares at the group. Good. All right. 
I hope you know you made the right decision. Armstrong turns around and retakes his seat. He gazes out again at the Italian coastline and considers the plan he just set in motion. Armstrong knows his teammates are scared. They don't want to cross a line and do something unethical. They don't want to be cheaters. But Armstrong believes what he told them. If the rest of the cycling world is using performance-enhancing drugs, then it is not cheating if they do too. It's only leveling the playing field. Armstrong is simply acting like a responsible leader, giving his team a shot at winning. And if all goes according to plan from here on out, winning is exactly what Armstrong is going to do. With dedication, hard work, and EPO, he's finally going to take over the world of cycling. It's evening in the fall of 1996, and about a year and a half later, Lance Armstrong is walking through his home in Austin, Texas. It's a dream house that, as a kid, he never could have imagined owning. A 5,000-square-foot mansion surrounded by palm trees. Armstrong enters a large bathroom that's designed with spotless white tiles. He looks around, grinning. The life he's leading now feels like a fantasy. And in seemingly no time at all, Armstrong has climbed in the rankings. He's now seventh in the world. And he's only 25 years old. But already, he has multiple endorsement deals which have made him a millionaire. But as Armstrong approaches a mirror, he can't help but notice how exhausted he looks. Of course, he just finished another punishing day of training. He has to keep pushing himself if he ever wants to win the Tour de France. But Armstrong knows he looks tired for another reason. Lately, he hasn't been sleeping well, and he's had strange pains that keep him up at night. Armstrong wishes he could figure out exactly what's causing them. It might be the result of all the drugs he's taken. He now not only uses EPO, but he's also taking steroids. But it doesn't make sense. His pains don't seem like normal side effects of those drugs. Armstrong presses a hand to his temple. He feels another piercing headache coming on. Something he's been fighting for days. He also feels another pain. Something he hasn't wanted to talk about with anyone. There's a nagging soreness in one of his testicles. But as much as Armstrong wants to get to the bottom of this, he knows he needs to fight back any serious worry. He's an athlete, and this is all probably just a side effect of sitting on his bike saddle for seven hours a day, seven days a week. Armstrong opens a drawer beneath the sink and pops five ibuprofen. Then he walks over to the bathtub and sits down on the edge, feeling dizzy and nauseated. For a split second, Armstrong is racked with fear. It seems like something is badly wrong with his body. And he can't have that. His livelihood depends on his ability to perform at superhuman levels. Any physical setback could end his career. Armstrong again shakes off the thought. He just needs some sleep. So he walks back to the sink and begins brushing his teeth. But as he spits, he feels a cough coming on. He leans over the sink and coughs again and again. For some reason, he can't stop. Finally, the coughing relents. But when Armstrong looks down, the white porcelain sink is splattered with blood. Armstrong feels his mouth go dry. Something is wrong, very wrong. And if he doesn't do something about it soon, his life and all his newfound success could be destroyed. It's October 2nd, 1996, in Austin, Texas. Inside a doctor's office, Lance Armstrong sits alone, waiting. The room is quiet and still. A nice relief after everything this morning. Armstrong has been shuttled from one exam room to the next. He's been prodded and x-rayed, and he's had endless discussions with nurses and doctors, all trying to figure out exactly what is wrong with him, why he's been having headaches, the pain in his groin, and recently spitting up blood. The test results are supposed to come back soon. And while the symptoms look bad, Armstrong is not worried. He's sure it's just some kind of minor infection, something he can treat with antibiotics and a little rest. Armstrong is about to get up to see how much longer he'll have to wait, but then he hears someone approaching the door. Yeah, come in. The door opens, and Armstrong's doctor enters the room. He's carrying a thick stack of papers and has a blank expression on his face. After his long day, Armstrong doesn't have the patience to wait anymore, so he decides to start the conversation. So please, tell me you found some kind of infection. No big deal, I'll have to take some pills, I'll be a little groggy, you know, so on and so forth. Lance. Oh, come on, just get on with it. Tell me what I have to take. The doctor pulls up a chair and sits across from Armstrong. He has a very concerned look on his face. And all at once, Armstrong knows something is very wrong. Oh, God, what is it? Lance, I'm sorry, but the results came back and showed you have testicular cancer. Wait, what? This is difficult news to hear, I know. And I want to talk with you about your options. No. Look at the results again. This can't be right. Lance, I'm happy to show you the results, but I'm afraid to say that they are conclusive. No. Now, do the test again. You made a mistake. I, you, you made a mistake. Lance, take a minute and breathe. I'm right here. And when you're ready, I'd like to go over your options. Does that sound okay? Armstrong looks at the doctor and nods. But it's not okay. None of this is okay. And out of nowhere, Armstrong gets an old feeling. Something he hasn't felt in a long time. Feels like a child again. Lost. Sad. Weak. And before he can stop himself, the tears begin to crawl down the side of his cheeks. He doesn't know what he can do. Or how he can make this go away. But one thing is entirely clear. Lance Armstrong's life is about to be turned upside down. Three weeks later, Lance Armstrong glides down a hallway at Indiana University Hospital in Indianapolis. He hears the familiar hum of rubber tires against the ground and shuts his eyes. He pictures the open road in the French countryside. Armstrong's head is swirling, and it's then he realizes he's not riding a bike. He's in a wheelchair, and it's being pushed through an oncology unit where cancer patients are treated, patients like him. 
Armstrong then remembers why he's so drowsy. For the past few days, he's been in an operating room as surgeons performed multiple operations to save his life. He was initially diagnosed with testicular cancer and had his testicle removed. The doctors soon realized the cancer had spread. They found tumors in his lungs and abdomen, as well as lesions on his brain. The doctor said his chance of survival was less than 50%. And yet so far, Armstrong has survived the surgeries. He's even well enough to receive visitors. So when the nurse opens the door to his hospital room, he beams when he sees a handful of his closest friends and loved ones. As soon as Armstrong enters the room, the group cheers for him. Armstrong can't help but grin and feel like he's just won a big race. One of his friends approaches and asks how Armstrong's doing. He summons all the bravado he can muster and says cancer treatments are no big deal compared to a day of training. The group laughs, and so does Armstrong. He hasn't felt this grateful and happy in a long time. A few minutes later, a doctor enters the room. He explains that he'll be prescribing the next phase of medications and has a few questions to ask. Armstrong nods and says it's fine. He knows he needs to get the best treatment going forward. The doctor smiles politely and says it might be better if they went over the questions in private. Some of them are sensitive. But Armstrong gazes at his friends and family and tells the doctor that these people flew here from all over the country. He's not going to ask them to leave now. So get started. The doctor hesitates. Then he starts with a series of basic questions. He asks about Armstrong's sleep schedule, his mood, his diet. It's all routine until the doctor asks if Armstrong has ever taken performance-enhancing drugs. Armstrong freezes. He can't believe he didn't see this coming. Of course they were going to ask this question. Armstrong looks at his visitors. They may be close friends and family, but if any of them repeats this information to the wrong person, Armstrong's career could be over. For a moment, he considers lying, but he realizes that could be a huge mistake. The doctor could prescribe the wrong medication, and that could cost him his life. So Armstrong makes a risky decision and admits the truth. He tells the doctor that he's taken EPO for the last year and a half. He's also taken testosterone, cortisone, other steroids, and growth hormone. The doctor nods unemotionally and scribbles a few notes. Then he thanks Armstrong and walks out. The room remains quiet as Armstrong turns back to his friends. Their smiles are gone. Some look angry. Others won't look him in the eyes. But Armstrong knows that this isn't such a simple matter of good and bad. The hospital room is full of his friends and teammates. He's seen some of them use performance-enhancing drugs at one time or another. And if they're judging him today, then they're hypocrites. He knows their secrets, and they know his. So as a group, they all need to remain quiet. Armstrong decides that he needs to change the subject. So he begins asking about the latest news in racing. The group starts chatting again, and soon the tension eases. Seems like everything is back to normal. But as everyone talks, Armstrong realizes something big. Today he made a mistake by admitting to doping. But from here on out, he'll never make that mistake again. It's July 4th, 1999, in a town in western France. On a concrete road, dozens of cyclists hover over their bikes, standing side by side. They're waiting for the official start of this year's Tour de France. Spectators cheer and wave their flags as they call out to their favorite riders. One of the fans yells out the name of an American rider who everyone seems to be talking about. Lance Armstrong. The cyclist who somehow managed to beat cancer and make it back to the most prestigious race in the world. When he hears his name called out, Armstrong smiles. He knows his story is a miracle. That's why the whole world seems to be talking about him. Still, as Armstrong stares at the long road ahead of him, he's not focused on cancer or the fans. He wants one thing and one thing alone. To conquer the Tour de France. Armstrong has spent the past two years getting himself into the best shape of his life. He's gotten some help from performance-enhancing drugs, and now with the drugs coursing through his bloodstream, he feels even stronger than before he got sick. He has no doubt that he could win this year's tour. A minute later, the crowd begins counting down in unison to the start of the race, but Armstrong tunes them out. He focuses, getting into the zone, where there's nothing except his determination to win. Finally, the race begins, and Armstrong launches himself forward. For the next three weeks, he's going to race over 2,000 miles. It'll be brutal. But when it ends, Armstrong knows he's going to leave his mark on history. And he's finally going to prove that he's the greatest cyclist the world has ever seen. Next on American Scandal, Lance Armstrong becomes a global icon. But to maintain his power, he need to take down a cycling legend. From Wondery, this is episode one of Lance Armstrong for American Scandal. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review. Be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen to episodes one week early and ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey to tell us what topics we might cover next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. That's Lindsay with an A, middle initial A, Graham with two A's. Be sure to listen to my other podcasts too, American History Tellers and Business Movers. A quick note about our reenactments. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about Lance Armstrong, we recommend the book Wheelmen by Reed Albergati and Vanessa O'Connell. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound designed by Derek Barrons. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Hannibal Diaz. Edited by Christina Malsberg. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. Wondering.